Hi, everyone. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're glad to have you with us for today's presentation featuring Chad Holmes, Security Evangelist of Cynario. Chad will discuss the healthcare ransomware risk landscape, the motives of attackers, and demonstrate the latest approaches to secure connected devices. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Cynario. Cynario is the industry leader in reducing healthcare risks related to IoT, medical IoT, and OT devices. The Cynario platform provides hospitals with the control, foresight, and adaptability required to stay cyber secure in a constantly evolving threatscape. They empower healthcare organizations to stay compliant and proactively manage every connection on their own terms with real-time IoT attack detection and response and rapid risk reduction tools so that they can focus on a hospital's top priority, delivering quality patient care. For more information, please visit Cynario.com. A few announcements before we get started. We're already planning the 2022 MD Expo in Atlanta. MD Expo strives to provide healthcare technology management professionals with a unique, intimate, and rewarding conference second to none. You don't want to miss our 20th anniversary next year. Please visit mdexposhow.com for details and registration. Okay, let's give one lucky attendee the opportunity to win a Webinar Wednesday shirt by answering the following question. Where is Scenario based? You can find the answer by visiting our sponsor's website. Please use the questions feature on the GoToWebinar dashboard to submit your answer. As always, today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. You can obtain your certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. I'll have more details on this at the end of today's webinar. We will wrap up with a live Q&A at the end of the presentation. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar by using the questions feature on the GoToWebinar dashboard. We'll get through as many attendee questions as time allows. As I mentioned earlier, our speaker today is Chad Holm. Chad, you may begin whenever you are ready. Great, thank you for the great introduction. Um, just to hit on one point there, would really recommend everyone go to MD Expo. We were able to attend the last one in Vegas in person, which was a little bit weird, but it was a great conference. So really, really love attending those. Um, and hope, hopefully we get to all meet each other uh, in real life in the very near future. So with that out of the way, uh, let's talk a little bit about today's presentation. Again, my name is Chad Holmes, um, and I'll be presenting uh, this talk on extending clinical engineering security skills. Effectively, how can we take the people that are working with the devices and making sure that they're there for patient care um, and teach them a little bit more about security so they can help in the, the bigger defense against ransomware and all the other cyber attacks that we're seeing. A little bit about me uh, uh, first, just so you know who's kind of talking to you. Uh, I am a security evangelist for Scenario, meaning I get to work with all kinds of really smart people, both within our organization and with our customers and with our partners and, and all over the place and learn what they're doing to better secure their environments. And that means I get to also share all that information with you. Sometimes I have to anonymize it a little bit, but for the most part, I can take what they're doing, how they're leading the way, and try to get more and more people to take those uh, approaches as well. Uh, my background is first in making things. I was a software developer, so I was, came out of school and I was writing code and pushing things to websites and things like that. Um, I started finding security issues in the military website I was working on. I'm sorry, military web services I was working on um, and really didn't like how those were handled. Uh, they were handled by saying, one, the firewall weenies will take care of it. Uh, and two, don't worry anymore about it. And, and I knew neither of those were really gonna help solve the issues. So I started getting more and more into security and started breaking things in a very productive way, working with people. I wasn't a bad guy hacker. I would just go in and, and, and on consulting gigs, help people break their systems and then teach them how to fix it. And as I worked with more and more customers, I realized, oh, there's a lot of really, really good, smart networking folks, software development folks, what have you, that if they got just a tiny amount of security training, and I'm talking in some cases, one or two days, they'd be outstanding security folks. So over the course of my career, I've kind of evolved into teaching others to think about how to both make things and break things so we can make them more secure. And in that vein, 
those will be my goals today, right? I wanna inform you a little bit about the cybersecurity challenges we're seeing in the healthcare space. Um, we're gonna discuss some rapid risk reduction options, right? Talk about how you can learn about security and then kind of spread out that security knowledge to others in your organization. Of course, I'm gonna answer any questions you have, so make sure to throw questions in that question panel over to the right, and I'll gladly answer them at the end. Um, and then I'll provide additional resources as we go through. A little bit about Scenario before we jump right in. Uh, we were founded in 2017 with a very simply stated goal. You know, stated it's, we wanna secure every IoT, OT, and medical device in healthcare environments. And while that's only 10 or so words to say, the actual task of doing that, as you probably know, is, is it's a huge task. It's incredibly difficult. Um, 2020 was a really exciting year for us be, beyond the excitement of what was going on in the world. Um, we were recognized not only as a Forrester Wave leader, but we were also a Gartner Cool Vendor. And on the back of those awards and some, some really quick development and, and really maturing technology, um, in 2020, we, be, we began, began our expansion from the, the few dozen customers we had at the time to hundreds and thousands and, and hopefully every hospital worldwide at some point in the future. So ultimately we're here to help protect hospitals from cyber, cyber attacks and other types of attacks specifically at the device level. And as we go through, I'll talk a bit more specifically about how we do that. Before we jump right into things, I always like to throw a stack, kind of like the quiz we just saw earlier about where we're based. Um, I always like to throw out a stat. So go ahead and, and, and you know, guess what this ransomware specific stat means in the chat box. I'll give you all just a, a few moments to, to throw it in there. Um, and I, I see some direct messages coming in. Um, just give you one or two seconds about this 580% number. And if you watched my webinar yesterday, you probably know this already. So this 580% number is the increase in healthware, healthcare ransomware attacks in the second half of 2020. So as with any data like this, there's a little bit of a lag. It's about a six to nine month lag to collect this information. But this time last year, you know, 11 or 12 months ago, people, hospitals were reporting a 580% increase in ransomware attacks. And these were just the ones that were compelled to report due to HIPAA laws or others. We, this is probably a higher number. And we don't expect this number to go down anytime soon. We, can, we expect to see continued attacks on healthcare systems for a variety of reasons that we're gonna to get to discuss throughout this presentation. So before we do that, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about. Um, first, I always like to start a baseline of vocabulary whenever we start a talk. I never wanna assume that everyone knows everything because you're here, you're here to learn. So we're gonna talk a little bit about IoT and healthcare and what I, I, IoT actually means in healthcare environments. We'll then talk about the rewards and risks introduced by those devices. We'll talk about the risk landscape and what that looks like in terms of the overall industry as well as real numbers with individual hospitals. Um, I'll then ask the question that I'm asked a lot about who's really in charge of these things, right? We have IT practices in place, but who's really in charge with securing all these devices? We'll then talk about how uh, traditional IT practices are being extended into IoT, as well as the misconceptions about how those extensions happen. Uh, I'll then do a little bit of self-promotion around how Scenario helps, and hopefully that'll be as productive as possible, and you'll love to talk to us afterwards. Uh, then everyone's favorite, I'll jump into some use cases. Um, today's use cases are gonna be a bit of a gamble because of the AWS outages we're seeing. So bear with me there if there's any slow responses or anything, but I do promise you uh, beyond AWS outages, they're usually a very simple, very smooth process. Uh, finally, I'll give you some guidance on how to take action today. The last thing I wanna do is come in and tell you for an hour, all these challenges you have to face and then just say, eh, good luck. So I'm gonna talk about some, some actions you can take today with your team to start making at least some baseline progress. And then of course, at the end, we'll, we'll talk about any questions you have. So again, type in those questions, I'll be happy to answer them at the end. So first, let's talk a little bit about the world of IoT and healthcare. And when we talk about IoT, it's more of a shorthand for four or five different sets of technology uh, that we encounter with our customers. The first set we encounter is IOMT, or medical IoT, or internet of medical things. It kind of goes by three different names. Effectively, these are devices that are providing patient care in some way, right? So they can be IV pumps, they can be MRI machines, CT scans, anything whose core functionality is to provide patient care would be considered a medical device, kind of, kind of simple there. It, they become IOMT devices when they become connected. So if they're connected over a network to a nurse's station or to 
a, um, a vendor who can monitor them and update them, that's when it becomes an IOMT device. So that, that's kind of the core set of technologies we see in hospitals a lot. Those are part of a bigger umbrella of technology called IoT. And there's plenty of IoT devices in healthcare environments as well, right? It's not just about medical devices in these environments. We often see things like smart door locks or security cameras or any of those things that have some core functionality that being connected to something else in some way, even if it's just to monitor and repair it, can enhance that functionality. So those are the IoT devices, the broader umbrella of kind of connected devices. Next, we have OT devices, kind of the cousin of IoT. If you think of healthcare like one big facility, one big building that needs to operate so that healthcare practices can, can successfully work inside, you start to see where operations technology becomes critical. These are things like HVAC systems, heating and cooling, uh, electric grids, elevators, anything that make that whole facility run would be considered OT. And then finally, we have connected devices. And I say connected devices because a lot of people use it as shorthand. You, you may have caught just 60 seconds ago, I use it as shorthand. Connected devices technically are, are really simple devices. Think like a light bulb that have one or two pieces of functionality often controlled by a phone. So a light bulb, for example, you can turn on and off, maybe change the color, or the, the, the dimness or something like that. For today's discussion, I'll probably use IoT or IOMT for, for shorthand, just so I don't have to say all of this every time. But if I slip and say connected devices or OT, just know that I'm talking about the general bundle of these connected devices, of these IOMT devices that we see in healthcare. And if you want me to differentiate at any time, again, ask the question, I'll be happy to differentiate towards the end. So the question that comes up whenever we're talking about I, IoT and IOMT security is are the rewards really worth the risks that they're introduced, right? There was a great article that came out last week where it was the nation's first um, medical cybersecurity director. I forget his exa exact name or title, but effectively it was an MD, super sharp guy that now is in charge of cybersecurity for his hospital system. And effectively he said, we have made huge increases in care through all these devices, but they have introduced risks that we were never ready for. And the rewards that come from them are pretty clear. I call this the more category, right? It allows for more care. It's easier to deliver that. It's faster. It's more accessible. Effectively, we have been able to provide better care to people over the last 15 or 20 years because we can get more data, more access, more timely decisions, just more from these devices. But they introduce a bunch of risk. Unfortunately, IoT devices do not have a magic button or configuration that say, this is going in a healthcare environment, make it super secure. In fact, it can actually be really the opposite, where devices are rolled out and because of all the compliance and regulatory measures they have to meet, if an issue is found, it can take even longer to address that issue in some cases. So we start to see that there's a lot of risks introduced to environments, even though the rewards outweigh those risks, right? These, these devices are connected to patients in many cases, the updates can take a lot of time. They're incredibly vulnerable to cyber attacks, and we'll talk about that in more detail as we go through. And then quite often, the ownership and responsibility of these devices uh, um, gets a little bit cloudy, right? We know biomed engineers or clinical engineers are probably gonna be most of the, doing most of the on-device work, but in a lot of cases, they have to be informed about what that work has to be, particularly when it comes to things like cybersecurity updates. So that's where things start to get a little bit, bit cloudy. Now I will say the rewards far outweigh the risks, right? It stinks that we're seeing breaches, it stinks that we're seeing a lot of ransomware attacks, but we're getting better healthcare because of it. So it's not a case of let's eliminate these devices, it's a case of how do we make them more secure. And to understand why these devices are seeing a lot of attacks, we have to understand kind of the threat landscape and the risk landscape that the medical system has built up. Now, now to be clear, I'm not criticizing the medical system. You know, healthcare is intended to provide healthcare first. Everything else is in support of healthcare. IT is in support of delivering healthcare. Security is in support of allowing you to deliver healthcare. So this isn't criticism, it's just kind of a, hey, this is the state of things. So the first stat here is there are roughly, in, in the United States alone, there's roughly 5 million devices that are operational providing care that have critical vulnerabilities. Meaning if an attacker identifies one of these devices and gets access to it, it's gonna be pretty easy 
to execute an, uh, 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 an attack on those devices. They're known vulnerabilities. You know, in many cases, they have payloads or, or attack patterns that can be followed to attack them. So we have lots of devices that are out there. Um, to put that one another way, there are roughly a million beds, it's just under a million beds in the United States, which means for every bed you have, there's probably five devices nearby with critical issues and more with other issues as well. Those devices are also, beyond providing care, handling information that is incredibly valuable to attackers. So if you look even just five or six months ago, we have an article out that says, hey, PHI, ePHI records are worth about three to five times as much um, as things like credit card records to hackers. The reality is in just those couple months since we published that article, those numbers have gone up way higher. It's now predicted that, that ePHI records are worth 15 to 20 times as much as something like a credit card record. And the reason is actually pretty simple. If you steal my credit card information, you get my credit card number, my expiration date, the CVV, my name, my current address, maybe one or two other things. Most of those things I can change pretty easily, right? I can't change my name all that easily, can't change my address all that easily, but I can cancel my credit card number and be done with it. So attackers, when they get information, have a very short amount of time to actually use it. My medical information, though, has a lot more data that's really, really hard to change, right? My medical information is probably going to have my name, my date of birth, maybe my social security, my current address, probably my last few addresses at a minimum because I've been at the same doctor for a long time, um, probably my parents' names, maybe their health history, maybe their addresses, my siblings' names, and it goes on and on and on. And a lot of that information is really, really difficult to change, right? I'm not gonna tell my parents to change their names if my PHI records get stolen. It's just, it's just not realistic. And so because of all this, those PHI records are incredibly valuable to hackers because they have now have all this information that can't be changed and they can use to apply to credit cards or, or get bank loans or whatever the case may be. So we now have all these, these devices that have crit critical issues, they're working with a a bunch of data that's incredibly valuable. Uh, by the way, the data is per record is about $250 to $500 per record being paid online right now. So very, very valuable when you talk about thousands of records. And unfortunately, in many healthcare systems, the network traffic isn't all that well monitored. You know, from what we've seen, about three quarters of the hospitals we work in don't monitor their network traffic by default. And most of the attacks that hit devices and that hit, hit hospitals don't execute over a matter of minutes and hours. They execute over a matter of months and quarters and seasons and years. Right? The average uh, time from you know, initial breach to, to full execution is somewhere in the nine month range. Meaning attackers can go in, hit your system, start finding all the data they need without fully attacking, maybe start finding other vulnerabilities. So if you fix one, they can attack another and then decide when they want to pull a trigger. And this all contributes to one of the reasons why we're seeing so many attacks. Healthcare environments are just naturally behind other industries. So when you see things like the colonial pipeline attack that hit oil and gas, or you see the pharmaceutical attack that hit Merck a few years ago, those industries very quickly respond and, and, and tell each other where to spend their money to, to, to avoid attacks. In healthcare, spend is always focused on care first, and therefore, quickly addressing these issues as an industry um, isn't, hasn't been an option up to now. Now that's changing, but for the most part, healthcare just naturally lags uh, um, in terms of addressing these attacks. And the reasons are pretty simple, right? I mentioned earlier, but the industry goals are to provide care first, right? Even for-profit healthcare systems, their primary goal is to provide care first. Again, not a criticism. That's what we want healthcare systems to do, but we have to acknowledge kind of some of the challenges that introduces. Additionally, hospitals are particularly vulnerable because outages aren't acceptable, right? If there is downtime, you can't just say, and eh, we're not treating pa patients. At a minimum, you have to divert them to other hospitals and work with those hospitals to make sure there's some kind of baseline plan, plan in place. And because it's a care first environment, the spend is always gonna favor patients. Again, leading to some of the technical insecurity that we see. We're also seeing things like regulatory requirements that are put in place with good intentions, but in many cases have some kind of negative outcomes as well. HIPAA, for example, in the US compels uh, uh, attacks that lead to breaches of over, I believe it's 500 records to be reported. And then those are posted on a big website that some people name the wall of shame. And that 
not only shames people saying, hey, you did bad, when in reality, they're just one of dozens and dozens of people that get attacked each month, but it also gives attackers more information about who's getting attacked, how many records are being breached, and where they may wanna attack them or some, some of their sister hospitals or similarly sized hospitals in the future. So there's some kind of data leakage that's happening, even though uh, um, the reporting is mandatory to help protect our data if there's been a breach, it's also feeding information to the attackers who are using that to better inform their attacks. We're also seeing that the technical results of that care first uh, uh, priority, prioritization leads to slower security adoption. That leads to a greater attack service, right? More, more areas you can attack that are gonna be more vulnerable. And in some cases we're seeing that healthcare providers are saying, don't worry, I have cybersecurity insurance, it's gonna cover it. And we'll talk about that in a little bit about exactly how much cybersecurity insurance tends to cover. And then, so you have all these conflicting goals. They're incredibly frustrating. There's a lot of details to think about. And then if you do get breach, you're immediately gonna get conflicting guidance in a very stressful time. The FBI, the DOJ, other organizations within the US government, they're gonna say, don't pay a ransom. We don't wanna encourage ransomware attackers. Perfectly valid advice. But in exchange for not paying, you're then going to have to uh, pay to recover your systems. And that's often going to be 30 to 50 times higher. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars there. So you take all the complexity, we take all the technical debt, all the additional targets. And then if you do get breached, you're going to have to pay tens of millions of dollars to make really, really hard decisions about do you work with attackers or do you work with US uh, just official, justice officials and even when you do all that, there's not gonna be any silver bullet that doesn't guarantee it doesn't happen again. It can be an incredibly frustrating place. To make it more frustrating, and I'm sorry, it's a lot of bad news, but we all know ransomware is happening a lot, so I'm trying to get as much information to the audience as we can. We also know that attackers are very smart people that are driven by money, right? Most of the attackers are not here to create chaos. Um, in fact, a lot of the attackers we see uh, some may call them lazy, I call them incredibly efficient. They look for the most direct way to drive more revenue. They look for the most direct way to attack someone and get them to pay a ransom. And so because they're efficient and because they're driven by revenue, they're gonna start to target the places that are easiest to get into. And what the exact split was, wasn't we weren't sure about until kind of September of this year when this great report by the Ponymon Institute and Sensinet came out. And effectively what the report did is it went through and it surveyed a bunch of hospitals, hundreds and thousands of hospitals that had been attacked by ransomware um, during COVID. So in the last 18 months or so. And it asked all kinds of questions and collected all kinds of data. And one of the questions it asked was, what was the source, what was the root cause um, of the ransomware attack that you experienced? And the results were kind of surprising because cloud applications, I think we all could have expected, yeah, that's a big, big attack pattern. Phishing, I think we all would have guessed, was right up there. But then third was the combination of IoT and medical devices, right? They account for as many ransomware attacks as phishing attacks do. And that was kind of mind-blowing to people. We knew it was kind of in the 5 to 10% range at least. We didn't realize it was nearly a quarter. And you can see there's on-prem, API, other, other, other types of attacks there. The biggest thing that we're starting to see customers take away out of this is, one, where attacks are, are, are uh, where, where the root cause of attacks are, has now been enumerated. We can start to figure out where we need to sp spend our efforts, spend our money, spend our resources because of where attacks exist today. In two, our customers are starting to say, oh, we already have X and Y and Z for cloud applications. We have phishing training once a month. We send emails, we test people, we have protections in place, but we're not doing a whole lot about IoT and medical device security. In APIs, we may have a little bit there. So what this is doing is not only telling you where attacks are happening, but it's also providing guidance on where you can probably get the best bang for the buck for future investments around security to help divert attacks. Now, it's entirely possible that you're doing all of these, and it's possible that you're not doing any or maybe one or two. So um, I gave another talk yesterday that talks about exactly where you should go for each of these. I'll gladly pass it along to anyone that wants to see it. But effectively, this gives you a rough breakdown of where you should spend your time and money to help better protect against ransomware and other cyber attacks. It's a great study, the, the, the sources at the bottom there. I highly recommend everyone take you know, 15, 20 minutes to read it. And so it's really, really easy to kind of talk about the theoretical stuff or the study stuff and the academic stuff. Um, 
but what things look like practically, I think helps drive the, the point home a little bit more. So what I wanna do is talk a little bit about the real numbers, both in terms of a use case around Scripps Health, and then talk more about what the industry is seeing on the back of attacks like this. So in April of 2021, uh, what, six or seven months ago now, Scripps um, disclosed that, uh, or Scripps identified that there was a malware attack happening internally. They didn't disclose it that day, um, but they did see an attack and started to handle it very quickly. Uh, we probably didn't hear about, a lot about it. It wasn't well publicized. Now, one week later, May 6, 2021, the Colonial Pipeline was attacked. And if you live on the East Coast, you definitely heard about this and you saw gas lines and you saw all kinds of other stuff. I dive again, another webinar I dive into, but there's a whole lot of information where Colonial just said, we were attacked, here's all the bad stuff, and they got out in front of the press. Meanwhile, Scripps just kind of sat silent. Four days after that, Scripps finally came out and said, hey, we've been attacked. You know, this is what we're seeing. We're diverting patients, et cetera. Um, Scripps, to their credit, I think they handled it about as well as you can. It's it's not an easy scenario. So this isn't meant to shame them all. It's more meant to, to provide guidance based on what we saw. Two days after that, Colonial was up and running again, right? In a matter of less than a week, Colonial went from identifying attack to back up and running. It took Scripps over four weeks just to get back up and running again. And the reason that I'm focusing on Scripps was because in August of 2021, so just a couple months ago, they started to, to disclose even more about the business impact on their hospital. Because when you look at things like Colonial Pipeline, they can just jack up the price of a gallon of gas a couple cents, and that covers all the lost cost, all the costs that they have to cover. Healthcare systems, you can't do that. You can't just make up for lost costs like that. And so when Scripps published these numbers, it was kind of mind blowing because it's one of the first really good in-depth look, in depth looks we had at how much a ransomware attack on a healthcare system actually looks like. In the Scripps uh, example, and, and by the way, Scripps is medium size. They have five hospitals, a couple dozen health centers, et cetera. They're not a huge, huge shame. In their example, those four weeks of downtime led them to over $90 million in lost revenue. It cost them over $20 million in response and recovery costs. Right now, they have $600 million in pending litigation, and who knows which way that number is going to go. They still haven't been issued regulatory fines uh, for HIPAA and, and other uh, violations. Now, those are capped at a million and a half dollars, but how they cap them, that number can change quite a bit. They can have multiple, uh, uh, multiple attacks and multiple fines within kind of one attack. And at the end of the day, cybersecurity insurance only paid out about $6 million. So Scripps is out of pocket over $100 million just to get back up and running because they didn't want to negotiate with the ransomware attackers, which is entirely understandable. Um, but it was a huge, huge loss, a massive loss. And, and again, I don't mean to shame Scripps here, but I just want to use them as a great example of what happens if you are hit by ransomware attack because I can promise you improving protection of your system is far less expensive than $110 million or so. And the sad fact is it's not just scripts, right? When UHG was attacked, it cost them $67 million to get back up and running. When University of Vermont was attacked with 63 million, Sky Lakes got lucky, kind of air quotes around lucky with 10 million. Um, Health System Executive, which is Ireland's public system, they're at 600 million and those costs are gonna be probably even higher. If you look back at the Merck pharmaceutical breach, that was over a billion dollars. So these numbers get really, really big in real costs. They're not theoretical, they're not hypothetical. These are the real costs that, that systems are experiencing. And we know that these could be even higher, but people are actually choosing to pay the ransoms instead. The Ryuk family of ransomware saw over $100 million in ransoms paid in 2020, with the average ransom being between a quarter million and kind of $1.4 million. So we know that's at least 100 attacks, just some back of the envelope math there, where they decided not to restore the healthcare system and instead paid the ransomware attackers and the ransomware attackers actually restored the system for them. It's a huge gamble. It's one that I wouldn't personally be comfortable making, but when push comes to shove, it's something that people are deciding to do. So the number of attacks are just through the roof, as are the prices for addressing them. And of course, the bigger number comes when we look at actually the impact on the overall healthcare system. We know in 2020, and, and these numbers will be updated soon because it's almost 2022, so we'll have the 2021 number soon. But we know last year there were 92 reported ransomware attacks, 
probably more. Those were just the ones that were compelled to report and, and, and stuck to, to, to the laws there. 600 providers were impacted. 18 million records were exposed. This year, that number is already over 40 million records. So we've more than doubled the number of patient records exposed. And the overall cost to the healthcare industry is now just short of 21 billion with a B dollars. And again, the calculation and cost components that go into that, kind of like we talked about with scripts, lost revenue, response recovery costs, the ransom paid. Sometimes you get a little bit of cybersecurity insurance, but then you got to face regulatory fines and litigation, repeat attacks. It's just a lot of really bad red colors there with that tiny, tiny bit of green that can help address some of it. So again, huge, huge costs to the medical systems where that money could be used to provide better care build more hospitals, build more wings, uh, um, and just better treat people. So it's something that we all need to work together to figure out. And so let's start talking a little bit more constructively because I've spent the last 25 minutes scaring y'all. So I, I apologize to that, but I, I find that stats are really good at helping paint that picture. The question we get whenever I present this is, okay, it's been doom and gloom up to this point. Let's talk about how we start to address this. Who's in charge of IoT security? And the reality is, kind of everyone and no one. And that's a really bad answer and I hate giving it. But you have to think of IoT security in terms of who knows what and who can help implement that. So you have security teams in the top left there and IT teams. Typically security is a subset of the IT team. They're often able to identify the security fixes that need to be put in place, identify the devices, where the devices are, they create tickets, they often push them to the CE and Biomed folks. I think most of the people on this call would fall into that bucket. So effectively, you have IT and security who are identifying the issues. You have CE, so clinical engineering and biomed in the top right there. You're the ones that are going to actually be going in and probably changing the devices in some cases. So you'll get a command, you'll see what you need to do, you'll clarify that ticket, and you'll implement it. Um, now, we are encouraging IT departments to be nicer with the tickets and not file a ticket and say, hurry up and do this. Uh, we find that there's some better interaction that can happen there, but that's kind of the typical flow, which is IT just tells Biomed, do X, Y, and Z now. And you also have networking in that same bucket as the Biomed folks, where IT will identify an issue and say, hey, we need to do something called micro-segmentation, say, segment the network using these policies, go, go, go. So the reality is that no one's really in charge because it's a combination of those that can identify the issues and those that can actually fix them. It's the combination of IT and security working with network CE and Biomed. And now that I've said that, you can ask again, really who's in charge? And it comes down to three factors. One is who can make teams available to address these, right? It's unlikely that, particularly in small hospitals, 70 to 80% of hospitals in the US are small hospitals. It's unlikely that in small hospitals, you can take the staff you have, make them all become cybersecurity experts and just boom, start making all these fixes. So you have to find a way to create available resources, whether it's bringing new teams on, whether it's going to vendors or, or MSPs or MSSPs, uh, managed uh, service providers, to, to up that staff. Now, again, I don't, I don't want anyone to be laid off. The, the goal is not to lay people off. It is to provide additional resources that can help you address these challenges. So leadership, often the CIO, CTO, um, in many cases, the, the leadership within clinical engineering is really good at this. They can create availability for resources. Next, you have to identify who has the access and influence to actually start putting actions in place. And this often sits in IT or security, and, and often they work together. These are the people that can get tools in place. They have budget for spend for new technology. They have people that can understand issues and how they work across the hospitals really well. So we need the leadership team to make resources available. We need IT and security to make sure that those resources are, are properly using tools, identifying issues really quickly and finding out ways to fix them. And then we have the people that are capable. Uh, again, like folks on this call, clinical engineering folks, biomed folks, network people. These are the people whose, whose feet are on the ground, their hands are on the keyboard, whatever the case may be, that they can take direction from the IT or security team, hopefully better direction than we see in some environments, but take that direction and put it in place. Whether it's changing a username and password on an IV pump, whether it's working with network to put new policies in place, there's a bunch of different ways we can do it. But if hospital leadership in particular starts to look at it from an availability, access and influence and capability standpoint, we're probably gonna see a lot better cybersecurity practices being put in place very, very quickly. 
And one thing that we always encourage people to do is start extending the IT practices they have to IoT. But as they're doing that, they have to remember that IoT and IT are not the same thing. The way that you manage a Windows 10 machine is not the way that you're going to manage a connected device. The, uh, for example, they're not going to be the way you manage a CT machine or an IV pump. They're very different technologies in many cases, and you have to think about different, different ways to manage them. So for IT solutions, you're going to have things like forensic, forensics and asset management and DLP. In IoT, you have to think about anomaly detection, risk management, policy management. Some of these overlap, some of these are unique. In many, many cases, the core concepts behind them are the same. For example, trust but verify, or don't trust anything by default. But the way you implement these are very, very different because the way you secure a workstation versus the way you secure a glucometer, say, are incredibly different tasks. So as you go through, just remember, all those devices can't just be easily extended from IT. You have to consider the different technologies and how to best put security practices in place. And the way we help with this, and I promise we're getting to the demo, we're getting to the fun stuff in just a second. We have two different ways that we actually help address this. The first is we have attack detection and response. And I really like our ADR offering because the story behind it is so cool. In short, we had a customer we were working with on a different project. We found malware, they didn't know how to handle it. So we went in really quickly and found out a way to make sure that malware didn't spread and then we eliminated it really quickly. When the dust cleared, we said, holy cow, this isn't just an incident response uh, incident. This is us creating a new product on the fly. So we went back, we worked on it for a few more months, and just a couple months ago, released attack detection and response. So think of this almost like virus scanning for your PC, but at a hospital-wide level. If you have an active attack that is flying under the radar, on the day that you install scenarios uh, systems, ADR is going to identify that alert you to it, and then give you options to, to immediately address it, whether it's quarantine, cut off that machine, what have you. So the first thing we do whenever we go into a customer is we scan and continue scanning the network in a passive, non-intrusive non way to make sure there are no attacks. And if attack happens, we're gonna identify it very quickly. Again, those attacks can last for nine months on average. So we have some time once we identify them to get rid of them, but that usually happens quickly. Then our more traditional uh, um, approach to securing systems is traditional only in that it's older than ADR, um, but it is a more modern approach than a lot of systems we see. We call it rapid risk reduction. The core components of this are segmentation. Effectively, only let devices talk to who they should be talking to. An IV pump in radiology should not be uh, talking to the Tesla that's connected to the network uh, in the parking garage. And yes, we see Teslas on hospital networks all the time and gaming systems and everything else. So all those thousands of devices you have in your environment, whether you mean to have them there or not, we want to make sure they're only communicating with other systems and other components they should. Let the IV pump contact the nurse's station, for example, but don't allow it to connect to thousands of other devices. Before we roll that out, we have segmentation analysis. We want to make sure that we don't impact the functionality of those devices in any way. So before we roll out the policies that segmentation creates, we, we test them fully and allow your team to review any exceptions. This means if we have, let's say 10,000 policies that need to be rolled out, your team doesn't need to spend months looking at them. You can look only at the exceptions. We also have things like service hardening and vendor access control. We wanna make sure if that your devices are reaching out for valid reasons or someone is reaching in like a vendor monitoring and maintaining a CT machine, that if they get hacked, you're not gonna be hacked as well. So we wanna make sure that ingoing and outgoing traffic is only allowed the access that it needs, no more, no less. Again, that was the really quick version of what we do. I'll gladly get a, a, a SE on the phone to give a much deeper dive if anyone wants to see these in action. It's a really cool system. So what we're gonna do now is actually jump into the Scenario platform for just a couple minutes before we go to Q&A and start looking at how you would actually use this in the field. And the very first thing we're going to do, assuming AWS is still up and running, <laughs> is we're going to look at a device recall research. We're going to say you're in a hospital and you need to find all the devices that have active recalls, a pretty simple use case. So we're going to go into the, the scenario platform. So let me go back to my dashboard here. Um, this is an environment, our demo environment, uh, where we have a bunch of different findings. In reality, what we would have done is put what we call a collector on, on site, it starts collecting data, doesn't interfere with your network traffic, but it does analyze it. 
And once we do that, we start to analyze that traffic for all kinds of issues. And in this case, we're gonna look at patient safety issues. And I'm gonna dive into those. Let me blow this up a little bit, make this a little bigger. I'm gonna look at issues with a high severity and a high impact. So we can see there's about a thousand issues that fall into that category. So you know, anything impacting patient safety, we wanna look at real quick. And you can see there's a lot of different things here. We have IV pumps and medicine dispensers and all kinds of stuff. But this use case, we wanna keep it really simple. We just wanna see what devices have active recalls. Because if we can find active recalls, we can probably identify the vendors we work with, look at uh, um, any information they put out around the active recalls and start to figure out what our game plan is there. So I'm gonna go into risks here. We're gonna see a whole bunch of risk titles pop up. There we go. And I'm just gonna break this risk group down into the device recall notice. That's all we're focusing on right now. And we can see there's actually 1200 plus devices in our environment that have active recalls. And it looks like they're mostly IV pumps. Now this is an uncommon, right? IV pumps are probably the most popular IoT device within healthcare environments. They're, they're kind of everywhere. You know, most of the environments we see have thousands, at least a thousand IV pumps. Some of the smaller hospitals a little bit less. But what we can see is because there are so many IV pumps and because IV pumps are actually really, really uh, 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 full of vulnerabilities, unfortunately, it's not uncommon to have to address all of them in some way. Now, realistically, you're not gonna take them all out of circulation. You're not gonna shut them all down. You're not gonna replace them. So you need to figure out what you can do about them. So what we can always do is go into this IV pump, take a look and we can see that there was a device recall notice. Uh, this one was initiated today just because that's when our system last ran on this. But we can see that there's an FDA recall number here. BD is the manufacturer. They gave a recall notice as well. We could go to BD, there's the PDF that pops up and we can actually see all the impacted information. So as with any recall, there's a little bit more work you have to do to understand what the issue is and how to address it. But with just what, three or four clicks in the scenario dashboard, we were able to go in and identify 1200 plus devices that have an open recall so next time you're working with your BD or other vendor to talk about you know, new assets you're getting, how to maintain the current assets, you know, if you're talking with a, uh, uh, someone that's maintaining your systems, you can bring up this conversation of we have 1200 devices with, with an active recall, how are you gonna make this right? And it's great power to have. It's great to be able to identify those quickly uh, um, and, and get to a spot where you can fix those quickly. Now, the next case we're gonna look at is looking for anything that has default credentials. Again, if you have a device that's running and the credentials are just admin and password or what, whatever the defaults are, those can be found very, very easily by attackers. So again, I'm gonna go back and focus on patient safety here. And instead of looking at active recalls, I'm gonna go to risks again and don't let that load. And instead of looking at device recalls, we're gonna look at default passwords. And we can see here we have Many fewer, so not a thousand this time or 1200. We have 30 devices, 39 devices, excuse me, that have a default password. Now, the good news from a biomedical engineering standpoint is a lot of these are just kind of IT, IoT devices, uh, universal power supplies we're seeing a lot here. But we also see you know, that some of these are medical and we need to take a look at those. So I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna look at the medical devices specifically. And we can see there's a bunch of CT machines and a couple X-ray machines here. They look like they're all GE devices. Great, next time we talk to the GE vendor, we can start to address this with them. But we can drill down into any one of these or all of these and see that there's privileged default password with this one. There's an old OS that we're also finding here. Um, in this case, it's, it's Telnet allows for default communication. It's just kind of wide open for attackers to come in. So again, not that you specifically are gonna address this issue, but because you're touching these machines, because you're working with these machines, having a knowledge that there's a high security risk on these is going to allow you to work better with the IT team. It's going to allow you to work better with your vendors and your management to say, hey, I wanna make sure this is functional, but I also wanna make sure it's secure. I've seen this issue. I have the resources available for you and how to change this. How do we make progress? So it's a really good way for you to get ahead of any security issues that may come in that may have slipped through the cracks. So you can make sure the devices you're in charge of and you own and you maintain can stay as secure as possible. And we're running out of time, so I'm going to a little fast through these. The third thing I'm going to show is stopping active attacks. And I'm going to focus on our ADR section. So this is the really cool use case I was telling you about earlier, where we had a customer who was under active attack, and we helped them stop that attack quickly. What we're going to do and go is go into our ADR dashboard and see if there are active attacks in this environment. 
in this case, we can actually see there's four, right? We can see there's an MRI machine under attack. We can see a medicine dispenser under attack, and it looks like we have two IV pumps under attack as well. So we'll just focus on one for today. Uh, we can see that this MRI machine has a suspicious connection to someplace called malware.wicker.org. It's in the Russian Federation. Oops, let me go back here. I clicked on that. It's in the Russian Federation. We know when it was last seen. We know that someone's browsing on the internet on this machine as well. Just nasty, gross stuff all over the place. If you see malware and Russian Federation, it's like right out of a bad 80s movie about evil, evil, evil stuff. But the reality is we see stuff like this all the time. We see places reaching out and allowing malware into the systems. So in this case, we can actually take three specific actions against it really quickly. We could quarantine it, meaning we just allow it to keep running. We don't fully take it offline, but we just minimize uh, um, the connectivity it has with other devices. We could micro segment it, so we could put it on its own segment in the network. And again, we could go into a lot more detail about that. Or we could just say, let it continue running in the environment, but we're not gonna allow it to access the internet. Now there's small differences we can talk about offline about this, but these three options can be very powerful in making sure that MRI machine, which is really hard to replace, can stay operational while not introducing any additional risk to your environment while you handle that risk. So I've run through the demos really, really quickly. I apologize, we're kind of coming up short on time, but if you wanna see any more of these, if you want have questions about these, let us know and I'll be happy to answer them. Just a few more things we can talk about before we get to questions though. First are some actions you can take today. The first thing I encourage you to do is just start talking with your team. Right, ask your team next time you, you have all hands or a department meeting, you know, how are you all working together to address security? I know practices are in place, I know it's, it's top of mind, but how are, how are you working together and how can you improve that? And ask specifically, we have thousands of devices that are connected in our environment. Most of them are IoT or IOMT devices. What gaps do we have between our traditional security practices that protect against things like phishing and cloud apps in the IoT protection that, that focus more on devices and things connected to patients. Where are their gaps and how are we fixing those? You may find that question kind of gets chirps and not a lot of answers, but it's a great place to start the discussion of there's a massive, massive gap, how can we start to protect it? Also start to think about what compliance requirements need action. Depending on your region, you know, you're gonna have different compliance requirements. Um, I believe it's in the UK where they're actually having people specifically have a medical device security plan in place by January or February of next year. So compliance requirements are coming up on us very quickly. Next is encourage your leadership and encourage your security team to understand response actions. Tell them, hey, let's, let's do some, some fun activity this afternoon. Let's sit down for two hours and let's act like we've just been hit by a ransomware attack and figure out what we're gonna do. In really mature environments, someone's gonna say, don't worry, I have an incident response plan printed out, it's in my desk drawer, I know exactly what we're gonna do. In most environments, you're just gonna kind of get a blank stare and say, sure, let's try it. But the reality is, if you go through things, if you understand that you know there's about a 10 to 20% chance of being attacked in any given year, you start to realize really quickly, you have to plan for that attack and practice what you're gonna do. And then kind of encourage your leadership. Um, not everyone can do this, but you know, if you have a good relationship with your manager or your leadership, ask them you know, what reasonable, reasonable amount of recovery costs and downtime can they handle? You know, Scripps was down for four weeks. It cost them over $100 million. In smaller hospitals, that may actually bankrupt the hospital, particularly if cybersecurity insurance doesn't cover the full top cost. And then finally, if you need help with any of this stuff, I mean, scenario, we can obviously help with the device security risk, that, that's where we sit. But if you have questions about those other categories, about different approaches, let us know. We have partners we work with that can address those as well. You know, we're happy to help you secure all those devices and make sure that they're not the root cause for a risk. And we wanna help you secure those other layers as well. So with that, I encourage you to contact us today and I will open it up to any questions. Thank you so much, Chad, for a great presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a question for Chad, please use the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We do have a few questions that have come in already, and we'll start with those. We'll try to get to as many questions as time allows. Our first question for you, Chad, is 
how much of the security workload should we expect biomedical engineers to pick up? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. And it's split down, it's kind of split between being the security experts and identifying where protections need to exist and actually implementing those protections. Um, in reality, my dream scenario is that biomed engineers are security aware, they have some baseline knowledge of what to look out for, and then when a command is given to them, a ticket is opened, whatever the, the, the communication pattern is, they feel comfortable in making those changes on devices to improve security, much like they would if there was any other patches or updates that needed to be made for functionality. So I don't think the overall strategic or, or forward thinking uh, um, impact is gonna be on biomedical engineers. That's gonna exist more in IT and leadership and security. But in terms of updating devices to address specific security issues, I think most, uh, uh, probably 30 to 40% of the actual effort is gonna be done by biomedical engineers. Now that's not saying you're gonna have a 30 to 40% increase in efforts. What it's saying is you may receive a few more tickets here and there to update devices. So again, the responsibility is split. You're going to do about 30 to 40 percent of the actual practical work, but I wouldn't expect more than a 10 to 20 percent up ticket, you know, at any one time in your workload. All right, our next question is, our clinical engineering team usually gets tickets from IT for security updates. Is there a different method that other teams see working better? Um, I think the ticketing method is effective, although it could be much more, there could be a much better human element. Um, what we see a lot of the time is there's a bit of tension between IT and clinical engineering because IT says, oh no, we have an issue, file a ticket. They file a ticket, it goes to the CE or biomed team, and then they immediately get a call or a text saying, hey, you need to fix this right now. Um, it, and unfortunately, sometimes that's the nature of security work is, hey, things are hectic. We need to address it quickly. So the ticketing system is effective. I just think there can be a bit better bridge between the team members there as well, some of the softer skills. So it's very effective. Uh, um, it is an efficient way to do it, which sometimes you need efficiency, but maybe a couple more ice cream parties or team meetings to make sure that you know, what might be lost in, in those uh, um, direct communication patterns aren't always seen as overly direct. All right, our next question is, lots of hospitals are getting hit by ransomware. Is this something that will get worse before it gets better? Uh, I wish I could say yes. Uh, we'll know the numbers for 2021 soon, but we're still seeing dozens and dozens of attacks each month. Uh, I believe it's the, uh, HHS website, I believe that's the, the right website, which lists all the attacks that impact over 500 records or more. I think there were 40 or 50 attacks last month, if I remember correctly, which averages out to six or 700 attacks this year. Um, so no, effectively attackers have found environments that are willing to pay, that have those constraints we talked about in healthcare earlier, um, and they're hitting them incredibly hard. And frankly, they're going after low hanging fruit. They, they're not even really hitting really uh, um, really difficult targets at this point. So I'd expect the healthcare industry to see more attacks before it starts to slow down. Our next question is, why is it taking so long for biomeds to be pulled into the security administration rather than having it dictated from IT to the biomed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, one is I think hospitals are just stretched so thin and because ransomware is still kind of new and people are figuring out exactly how to respond, that it may not be a consideration to always bring biomeds in. Um, one trend, we actually saw this at MD Expo, it was the first time we saw it, the really big trend, so I was really excited to see it. Uh, we're seeing clinical engineering leadership is becoming a really, really good bridge between the IT and security teams and the biomed teams. And so those are very often um, folks that either came from IT or biomed and just understand both sides of those departments. So it's hard to pull people in from other departments, uh, particularly if you don't have a full understanding for them, but look to your clinical engineering leaders in particular, because they seem to be doing a really good job 
uh, bridging the gap in the more advanced hospitals that we've seen. Our next one is how do you enforce the micro segmentation in the scenario act? Is this done via policies that are pushed down to the switch level? Yep, certainly. So what we do is we create policies um, with, within our system. Uh, we then run those policies against copies of your network traffic for a certain amount of time. It's typically about 30 days um, to make sure there's no functional impact on that. And we can adjust those as needed. Um, once the policies are tested and exceptions are handled, we will then integrate with your systems, either the switch level, uh, the, the red level, NAC, however your system works, we will integrate it to push those policies directly. Um, we can do that automatically. More often than not, our customers want their hands on the button so we can just provide them the policies to roll out in the way that they want. Every environment's a little bit different. Um, so we just expose our APIs and integrate with, with your other systems APIs to, to enable that. But um, yeah, it is us creating the policies and then pushing them to your in-place systems in most cases. All right, next is how would you advise your customers manage their biomed engineers who don't necessarily have the security or IT background so that they understand the importance of hardening these medical devices? There has been a lot of pushback from techs at our hospital when asked to install patches. Either they don't know how to patch these devices or they don't feel responsible for patching. Yeah, that, that's a tough question because a lot of times when biomed engineers are trained, at least in some cases, I shouldn't say a lot, you know, their focus is on the functionality of the device and making sure it's able to provide care, which is kind of the core goal of all this stuff. Um, this goes back to, to ice cream socials and soft skills. Just telling a biomed team member, hey, you have to do this, that's a natural IT reaction, but it's also a really good way to, to, to add tension to a situation. I find with most people, if you explain why it has to be done, what the importance is, and how much bigger issues could happen if it's not done, in, in, a, in a productive way, of course, just that little bit of soft skills can ease the tension and they will quickly change from skeptics to your biggest champions very, very quickly. Um, so it's it's less about dictating and telling people to do things and explaining to them. Um, and more often than not, you're going to see some wins that way. Thank you so much, Chad, for your time today and for a great presentation. I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the services they provide to our industry please visit Cinerio.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your continuing education certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed to you one hour after the completion of this webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your 1CE credit from the ACI, and you'll be able to download your certificate immediately once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back soon with another webinar. Please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.